good. I thought the desserts were nice. Um, we'll be starting here in just a moment. So last minute technical glitch. Um, just uh, one announcement out of consideration for everybody. Uh, if you've got a cell phone, if you might turn that off or at least put it on vibrate if you must remain in touch. And uh, if you've got a laptop that you're switching on and off, maybe you could mute that so we don't hear the musical jingles. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the panel and we'll get things going. I guess we'll get started. Um, we think uh, that this is a pretty important topic, and I guess maybe some of you here do. It's, it's fairly new, so uh, we didn't expect to pack the house. We're kind of glad this many people showed up, actually. Um, a lot of people don't really understand what this is about, since it is fairly new. And we, we've been working on it for a little while. And um, we, we've seen out in the industry, um, a lot of people trying to do something like this and just sort of uh, looking for a better word than flailing, but uh, that's what comes to mind. It's sort of thrashing about trying to understand what the bad guys are doing to them um, you know, as they watch their boxes get owned and various things happen after that. Um, so. Most people working on this are involved somehow in the government, it appears. Uh, many of them have been doing this for years. Uh, obviously, the military has been involved in adversary characterization for a long time. Um, you know, they, they do want to understand their enemy, uh, their tools, tactics, procedures. Uh, lots of manuals written, lots of things uh, going on there. Not all of it um, works in the cyber environment. Um, so recently, uh, probably I'm guessing the past five years, people have started thinking about it. Uh, there's a lot of talk about critical infrastructure and how to protect it. And they sit around and have big meetings and uh, talk about what they would do to take down critical infrastructure and come up with these worst case scenarios and whatnot. And I think the people that are actually doing more are probably some of the, uh, the commerce folks because money's involved. And uh, that seems to get people a little more motivated to take care of the problem. There have been uh, a few workshops. Uh, I've been involved in some. Others have probably been involved in a few others that aren't on here. Um, the Department of Defense mainly has been doing insider threat type studies uh, because that seems to be their main concern. Uh, although I see them doing a lot of things that look like they're, they're battling the external script kitty because uh, at least initially, a lot of their uh, commands, whatnot, as they came up on the internet, were under attack, if you will. Um, a lot of times it was just people playing around. They see a gov or a mill site come up, um, you know, looking for a powerful computer to do something on, looking for more bandwidth. Pretty easy to knock over that many years ago. Uh, things are getting better but not because they're thinking about the adversary characterization, just because they're finding out better ways to keep up with patches. Um, so these workshops, um, you know, we got a lot of people together. Uh, I'm not sure we made a lot of progress. We came up with a lot of uh, action items and whatnot, and there hasn't been any funding to continue this research. And so I had a, uh, a workshop last year in, in August where I invited pretty broad spectrum of people, uh, some of these guys here, and uh, you know, brought people in from law enforcement, from government, from the intel community, um, psychologists, sociologists, uh, all types, to try, to try to come up with parameters and attributes and how we can narrow down and understand you know, what, what drives these people, uh, not just what tools they're going to use, the cyber presentation that we're going to see. We're going to see them take a box as a defender. Um, you know, we'd like to get ahead of that curve if we could. Uh, we wanted to have more follow-up on this. We haven't yet until now. And we've talked about more, more workshops to come. Uh, I didn't get a lot of support from my company. And uh, as
as I said, there wasn't a lot of funding out there to continue. Um, there is starting to be now. So I think we're going to start making more progress. Um, as I said, the defenders pretty much came up with a lot of bad assumptions. Um, and I'm not sure if they just think differently or people are just too easy to agree with their colleagues. And we're trying to change that as well. Um, a lot of people will come up with an adversary model where they're really more more than talking about the attacker themselves, individual or group, they're talking about the attack that they see or expect to see. So they come up with you know, ways to decide if an adversary could do this. Uh, mostly the high level adversary across the spectrum um, usually start down a hacker and go up to foreign nation states. And there's lots of other things in between that you'll see on some other slides. Um, they attribute things like resources and, and complexity, how hard it might be to put together and detectability or stealth, how, how easy can they hide it? Uh, because they, they believe these guys don't want to be caught. Uh, that kind of thing starts wars and stuff. They, they don't want to do that. Um, as I said, the defenders think differently. They, they put it together. It's, it's sort of their baby. They think it's going to work. They've tested it the way they know how, pretty much the way they expect it to work, and, and, and it sort of works. Then someone perturbs it, and it doesn't work that way or doesn't respond in a way they'd like to they're back to the drawing board. Um, we have to show them that a lot. And I think if you're into even penetration testing, penetration testing or any other security analysis, you've probably seen that happen too. The, uh, the developer is just way too close to it. Um, I think Matt will be getting in more into the threat profile at the end of this, and uh, we won't say anything about chasing the, the top 10 list. I, my personal opinion, um, there isn't always a reconnaissance phase, intel gathering phase for these things, which is what a lot of people expect. So the port scanning becomes important to a lot of people. Um, I think that's something you can drop on the floor. You might put it in your back pocket and say, oh, okay, there's a new port coming up, something anomalous. But if they're trying the same old thing, um, most people shouldn't really worry about that a whole lot, from, of course, unless they're unprotected. We talked about know your enemy. I think uh, a lot of you have probably heard and seen the honey pot, honey net stuff. Um, they, they, I've not seen a lot come out of them about adversary characterization. Uh, know your enemy does not necessarily mean going to an IRC and, and listening to the chat about what they did somewhere or looking at IDS logs. Um, some of those things will have input to it, but uh, we need to go a lot farther beyond that. Um, you know, it says here, understand the threat. So every environment is going to have a different threat. Uh, so that makes it hard because now it's custom. And people don't want to necessarily do that. You have to actually look at individual system to mission impacts. If you understand the mission of, your, of a fairly complex system, do you understand the impact of a single system being taken? You know, are there trust relationships? Are there dependencies that can be taken advantage of? Uh, a lot of people don't see all the connections there. Um, and of course, policy is something that a lot of people talk about, some people have. Uh, it's not always in line with as built. As designed versus as built um, doesn't always work in the real world. So they might have a nice policy, but it really doesn't have anything to do with their current environment. And if they do, it's, it's hard to keep up. Um, again, back to the assumptions. It's, it's easy to go ahead and think about the likely or obvious things and the impacts, but the hard ones are, are really the, uh, the unexpected ones, the ones that you sort of discount because they'll never do that. Um, so you think, they'll never be able to break into this software and suddenly there's a new vulnerability. Right after that, there's an exploit found, bam, you know, you're the first one taken. And so everyone else has the advantage of, of that because now they can get fixed. Signatures will go out and, and you can watch for it and maybe you're protected whereas if you're the first, you're not. And uh, I think we'll see some slides on that there here shortly. Um, as I said, the kinetic world doesn't always translate to the cyber world. And a lot of that comes out of the people in the military, um, you know, throwing metal against hard targets or even soft targets. And they sort of understand that. And then they, you know, get into these strategies, general versus general stuff, moving chess boards on, or chess pieces on a board. Um, they're, they're trying to, they're struggling to understand the cyber world. They 
part of that is because they don't understand the effect, the, the impact of their mission. And it's difficult, again, because it's new. And to a lot of these guys who've been around for, well, I shouldn't speak, for, for 20 years, um, it's hard for them to transition. And so they have to look at a lot of young guys and, and hope that they're right. Um, you know, again, the assumption, a lot of times we think of an individual doing something. You know, we, we talk about the virus writer who lets go of this virus or you know, turns it into a worm or whatever. Um, we don't know that there aren't groups involved behind it. Um, you know, we, we talk about what resources they might have, what capabilities they might have. Um, we're guessing. We're guessing because we're on the end, receiving end of it. We don't know what they're thinking. We don't know when the attack starts, when the attack stops. We see a, a little bit of it, just bits and pieces as it goes. Um, yeah, as I say, the, the, given the same tool, if, if I gave the same tool to every one of you uh, and, and gave you a goal to go do something with it, uh, I, w I wouldn't expect to see the same thing from everybody. Um, we'd start to probably look into backgrounds and, and things if we saw groupings of people doing the same thing. I think it would be pr pretty interesting. But uh, in general, we see people do different things with the same tool. And that means they might modify it. They might, uh, you know, say, for example, NMAP, you know, simple scanner of some sort, port scan. Um, some people are just going to go blasting right at it and just hit every IP they can. Some people are going to take their time, maybe throw a packet or two, wait, packet or two, wait. Um, a lot of these things are attributes that they put to the high-end adversary. They tell them that they have plenty of time. Uh, some of these people do this reconnaissance for years. Um, so there's lots of different things there. Um, yeah, I'll leave that one. The, another thing we have to be aware of is what I call the win-win situation, where the adversary comes in and gets some information, perhaps learns something um, that we didn't want them to necessarily, but we don't see an initial impact on the mission. We're, our web server's still up, uh, our database's still running, everything looks fine. He may have come in and planted some code. We don't know that until the attack starts. Then, then we know. Now go ahead and change the slide off a little bit faster. Um, so some of the things we do as we call red team, uh, some of you may have heard the term, some people probably think it's different things. Um, we've tried to change that a bit. It's not just bunch of guys getting together, you know, this side of the room is bad guys, this guy's good guys, you defend, you attack. Um, I won't say we've made it a science or necessarily even an art, but we've, we've tried to make it a little more credible and consistent by understanding the adversary we're portraying, uh, using the tools, tactics, procedures that we expect to see in a given environment. Um, again, that's, that's not always easy. And of course, the second bullet there, a lot of things we do, there's starting to be laws against it. So we I don't really worry about it a whole lot right now, but we're probably going to have to worry about it eventually. When we do these things, we get the get out of jail free card. So we're usually okay. Um, one of the things that we've talked about, and, and again, some of that came from the, uh, the workshop, is what we call the Cyber Adversary Research Center. And I think it's probably going to be uh, evolved into some sort of consortium because, again, a lot of it's volunteer effort. And there's not a lot of people out there that uh, are willing to give us money yet. But um, by doing things like forensics, some of the obvious things, unfortunately it's after the fact, but you can learn some things. And uh, you know, I think Toby will talk about what he does to extract information about the attack and infer what the attacker can do with that. Um, we need to get more detailed with the characterization. A lot of people initially went to these high-level models and they run them through lots of different, you know, uh, some of you may see, you know, these, these simulations run, a lot of math behind it, sounds real good, but I, I don't think there's enough detail in the model. So they're making, again, assumptions about the adversary that, that don't fly, so you, you get a false sense of security in the end. Um, so we're gonna attempt, you know, through the years, to come up with parameters and attributes that we can actually model the adversary with, and potentially uh, detect them, uh, we call cyber observable, as we see. Maybe the sensors don't exist now. Maybe it'll be a correlation of IDSs and, and other 
sensors like that. But uh, the, the main idea is to bring focus to the area, uh, show how it's relevant, show how, how it works, and uh, build a research community that can solve the problem and help the defenders. Um, so, so we want to characterize, and, and the, the theoretical part is for the, for the model folks, for the people who aren't necessarily hands-on, but need an adversary to input into their modeling and simulation, or policy, or whatever. And uh, in, you know, in practice, we want to be able to find them. We want to be able to continue, because the, the information changes. The tools they use, um, a lot of the tactics may be the same. That may be some of the kind of thing that you can use uh, you know, back to the Sun Tzu stuff, art of war. Uh, if we see an adversary doing something, you may be able to infer something behind it. You, you may be able to infer intent eventually. We got a lot of work to do before we get that, that far. And uh, so what we've done is conceptualize the idea of, I, I'm not sure who termed it, maybe it was you, the, the hacker pie idea, is that everybody has a piece to bring to this. So we're trying to make a full pie. We're going backwards, so we don't have a pie to cut up. We're trying to make a pie. And we all bring something to some different elements to the table. And we're, we're trying to put it together. And uh, you know, hopefully we can reach our goal eventually. And with that, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it over. I'll try not to scrunch the mic too much. Can everybody hear me? That's good. I'm going to try to keep this a little shorter than Dave. Um, <clears throat> but to, uh, my name is Toby Miller. I work for Computer Sciences Corporation. As you can see, my email address is up there. Um, I, about this time last year, I started working on a, on a project about rating your uh, hacker, your attacker, your enemy, whatever you want to call it. And uh, <clears throat> these next six slides will give you, five slides, will give you a brief overview of uh, what I did, what I've done, and what I plan on doing. Um, point, point scoring. I've given, I've given a pr presentation similar to this at SANS. I've gotten a lot of feedback. A lot of people are like, why do you have points? And my simple answer is the easiest thing I could come up with. Um, and I like the KISS philosophy, keep, keep it simple, stupid. Nothing complex, nothing that would require um, a degree in physics to figure it out. <clears throat> Why did I do it? A couple of jobs I've worked at, I've uh, seen analysts, IDS analysts, look at in-map scans, look at any kind of traffic whatsoever, and they knew nothing else about it. They, could, they just had no clue on what kind of threat it provided us, you know, whether this person or this attack, you know, um, was a bit, was a big deal was you know was dangerous so on and so forth um, so I came up with a system although the system to be perfectly honest um, it it, ten, it tends to uh, move more toward a threat system more than a rating system it kind of combines the two um, and also the third reason is uh, to help management with the decision making process uh, managers need to be aware of the threat of Possibly, if you can't come up with the, um, a rating or a profile of your adversary, you know, the guy who's attacking you or, you know, is going to attack you or whatever. Um, and that way they can make a, a better decision. Go ahead. Um, I have some categories that I used. I did passive OS fingerprinting or fi uh, fingerprinting. Um, I got a lot of flack about that. Um, I think uh, the source operating system can tell a lot about the user who uh, used it. Um, I've had all kinds of arguments uh, that go against that and for that, so I just decided to keep it. Um, intelligence gathering, um, certain types of intelligence gathering are more advanced than other types of intelligence gathering, so I added that in as well. The attack, um, I, I thoroughly believe that uh, certain ta attacks require more skills than others, and therefore they should be uh, uh, scored appropriately. Um, the exploit, I 
think somebody who's using a zero day is probably a lot more advanced than somebody who's going to packet storm and downloading uh, some code that's three, three years old. Uh, backdoors and cover-ups. Uh, we're talking rootkits. We're talking uh, anything like that. Um, certain type of rootkits are more advanced than others. If you come up with your own one that that uh, that gets the job done and, and it's hard to find, then in my in my system you get more points. Um, and finally, you have others. Others would basically uh, cover anything not covered in the first five categories. Uh, Actually, uh, one, there's, there's the t uh, total score as well, which um, I break it up into uh, a couple of uh, different uh, categories as far as script kitties, a basic user, a power user, a systems administrator, and an advanced uh, hacker, attacker, whatever you want to call it. And finally, um, the past, present, and future. Uh, I published an article on incidents.org last year about, about this time. Uh, about the rating, about rating your attacker. Um, since then, I have uh, created a website, ratingthehacker.net. Um, I'm currently on revision two. I'm working on revision three, although um, until I, I get some more input, I'm not going to really uh, publish anything anytime soon. And uh, that's really about it. So I'll uh, pass the mic to uh, Matt, or I'm sorry, Tom. When we uh, first uh, started looking at this a year ago at, the, uh, at Dave's workshop in, uh, in Virginia, um, some of the models I brought to the table were mainly based around what we call the vulnerability um, kind of food chain, the way in which um, the person at the top of the food chain discovers the, the vulnerability um, and how it disseminates into, into the public domain uh, and the placing of the adversary on that food chain and using that placing to determine the kind of adversary that they might be. Um, okay, so um, we, we've, we mainly work around two, two types of, well, my models work around um, two types of, uh, of classification. Um, the first um, is around uh, technique classification, um, whether it be uh, the technique that they're using for port scanning, you know, are they being fairly covert about it, are they, um, are they just, you know, Randomly, you know, scanning, you know, your network from their home IP address in the hope that they find, you know, some five-year-old vulnerability, um, and, and also um, techniques like using um, kind of mass routers. Um, obviously, your kind of high-end adversary isn't likely to use a mass router um, because it, it's kind of obvious that it's going on. Um, this kind of cross-reference with the uh, with the tool classification models. Um, the, the port scanning technique um, will have a direct relation, obviously, to the, to the tool that they're using. Um, obviously, um, mass routing tools, um, again, you know, you have a lower end adversary. If you have a, a customized tool, um, then you're, you're probably going to have a higher end adversary. Um, the, a recent example would be the, the DCOM um, exploit HD more posted um, to Metasploit uh, three or four days ago. Um, there were there, there have been some some exploits floating around that attempt to to, to employ a mass routing technique on that exploit. Um, from this, we can make two characterizations. Firstly, the guy that wrote the the mass router, and secondly, the people using it. Um, if the guy truly knew uh, the, the nature of what he was exploiting, he would have realized that by trying to brute force the return address, you know, he wasn't going to have much success because it's you know it's a one hit wonder. The service crashes after the first time you get it wrong. Um, um, okay, um, also, obviously, um, some exploits are, are more available than others. Um, if someone attacks your, your system with, a, with an unknown um, exploit, um, then th they're probably going to be more of an adversary. Um, than someone that attacks your system with a five-year-old exploit. Um, all exploits have, have their origins. Um, 
obviously the, this uh, the, the kind of the vulnerability discovery um, web diagram comes into that. We'll look at that in a second. Um, and the ease of use of the exploit, um, you know, does it um, have hard-coded offsets, uh, return addresses in, in the code, um, you know, that you just run and it, it goes straight in there? Or does the adversary have to uh, find their own return addresses? Um, do they have to understand the, the, the nature of the vulnerability? Um, what mitigating factors are involved in exploiting that vulnerability? Are there any prerequisites? Do you need access to a name server? Uh, if you're doing a man in the middle attack, do you, you know, does the adversary have access to you know, the name servers of AOL.com to you know, DNS poison or whatever? Uh, could you? Okay, um, the disclosure food chain. Um, obviously, all um, tools and exploits have a story. Um, most exploits are, um, I would say, you know, kept, kept private for, for 10 to 20 days. It obviously depends on you know, the, the ethic, you know, the policy of whoever wrote it. Um, it it's often, it, it can be you know, months, even years, until um, exploits you know, filter into the public domain, even if they're exploiting a, you know, a three-year-old bug. Um, what we try and do is, um, is characterize people based on um, where they are in the food chain. So, I mean, even if they've written an exploit which is three years old, you know, that they, they're going to get um, additional points for doing that. Um, okay. Um, obviously, certain exploits are written by individuals. Some are written by groups. Um, in the case of a, an, explo an exploitation by a certain group, um, if it's a private exploit that it's, say, I, I don't know, if Tesso, you know, had a, you know, a zero-day Apache exploit, um, you know, if, if, if you, you know, if we knew about it but we didn't have it and we knew that guy was using it, then, you know, he may very well be, you know, a Tesso member. Um, Therefore, we can characterize him by, you know, the likelihood is he's going to be friends with Tesso, even if he's, you know, not a, not a member of it himself. Um, and therefore, we can um, characterize, you know, his facility to, 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 to gain further exploits, just as in, um, in real combat, it is an advantage to know the, uh, the, the weapons, um, you know, uh, an adversary has, you know, whether it be nukes or, you know, biochemical weapons. Um, it's also of use to be able to determine um, the kind of um, the kind of exploits that uh, an adversary may have to future protect your network. Um, and the pyramid metric. Um, um, I'll finally leave you with this. If you can, uh, if you can read that. Okay. Um, right at the top there, we've got um, the, uh, the 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 uh, discovery of the vulnerability. Um, and right below that, we have um, the, you know, the discussion of that vulnerability um, within kind of closed groups, whether it be you know, private lists such as ZeroDD, um, or you know, whether it be their you know, local 2600 or whatever. Um, and then there are two paths that um, it can follow. It either goes down the black or the, or the gray. Um, obviously, you know, sometimes exploits get leaked. You know, it could be you know, traded in the underground. Um, or um, the exploit may be, um, you know, pushed over to Microsoft, in which case, um, you know, it gets fixed. Um, and even though the exploit will uh, eventually leak, you know, by that time we'd hope that most people have patched. Pass over to Matt now. Good afternoon. Mike Key, I want to speak as to why threat assessment is important to me and kind of the perspective that I bring to it. Uh, my name is Matt DeVoe. I'm the head of the Terrorism Research Center. Uh, in addition to looking at conventional terrorism issues, we also spend a lot of time looking at issues of cyber terrorism. <clears throat> so this topic in the workshop that Dave held was of interest to me from that perspective uh, in being able to look at adversary characterization from a cyber terrorism perspective, uh, as well as some of the lower thresholds and even higher thresholds of threats, such as hackers and nation states uh, on the other side of the spectrum. The key point, or the key thing that I encounter when trying to do risk management within organizations is that security or attacks are seen as merely 
a technical problem. Uh, it's packets coming across the network, and that is the complete foundation for what you're facing. My friend Jay Healy has a good quote that he's used many times, saying, your adversary is not a one or a zero. When I'm doing risk management, whether it be for a government institution uh, or for a critical infrastructure provider or an e-commerce company, one of the key things that we need to know from a threat perspective in the risk management process is the capabilities and intent of the adversary. I don't need to know that there are packets flowing on a network. I need to know who's behind the packets. Need to be able to differentiate the adversary to do security planning and incident response. Obviously, if you know who's on the other side, it'll dictate uh, what sort of response you provide. It's an essential piece from my perspective of risk management. It's the piece that's completely missing right now. Uh, I'll put up a slide in a few minutes that shows the risk management process. Threat characterization is a piece of that, yet you can turn uh, nowhere really in the community and get information with regard to what threats you're facing, what capabilities they have. And without doing that, you're not really performing risk assessment. Either you have a lot of money or you're protecting against inappropriate threats or you're not protecting against anything at all. Next slide. When looking at issues of risk exposure, here are the, the variables that, that we look at. What threats slash adversaries exist? And I'll show you a listing of the categories that we use. What tools or capabilities can they use? And I don't want to have a, a complete download from security focus, but I want a characterization somewhat like Toby's done with regards to what are the different classifications of capabilities that I might face. And if I can start to vector those different threat agents with different threat capabilities, I can start to get a better understanding uh, of what my security posture is going to be required. How attractive is the target? One thing that I uh, always hate about certification, especially within the government, is it's checklist-based certification. All systems are treated equal. And all systems are not equal from the adversary's perspective. There are some systems that someone might not give a damn about. There are others that uh, are important from the threat perspective or very attractive from the threat perspective. We need to include that component in your analysis. Uh, and you can't look at that piece as kind of a chicken and egg syndrome until you look at uh, what threat and adversaries exist out there. Then you'll know what's their goal uh, or intent or likelihood that they're going to attack a specific system. What level of access can be obtained? This is the piece that the industry has down, right? This is the, the assessment piece, vulnerability assessment component. We know how to do that. We know how to look at the system and determine what vulnerabilities exist, uh, with the exception, you know, obviously, of zero-day exploits, things of that sort. But we know how to go through the assessment process and feed that into our risk management. What impact would the attack have? Also good for calculating risk exposure. If it is a low-impact system, even if there are adversaries out there with the capability and the intent to attack it, it might not justify uh, as much security funding, as many security resources against it. So as part of the rating scheme, you need to look at that as well. And then, of course, the safeguards that can be deployed to minimize exposure. Uh, when I normally give the presentation on this topic, it's about two hours long, but one slide I use looks a lot like a uh, timer, uh, a sand timer. And it shows that despite who the adversary is, there are quite a few core vulnerabilities or core types of capabilities that they'll use to exploit a system regardless of the outcome. By looking at some of those common safeguards across all of the adversaries and all of the outcomes, uh, you, can, you can go after some of the low-hanging fruit. <clears throat> I don't have a laser pointer, but you see the cyber threat assessment piece right in the middle, and the threat agent identity capabilities information being a feed into that. Right now, when we do complete kind of risk analysis, that cyber agent uh, threat capabilities information is derived kind of on a case-by-case -case basis from expert opinion. Uh, if you're within the, the classified environment, there's more material that you can draw on to look at those issues, but for the most part, it's the unknown variable. That's the key issue or the key thing that brought me uh, to, to look at collaborating with this group here. Next slide. Threat agents of interest, here's how we characterize them. There are a lot of variations. Uh, this list has been around for a while. I'd like to differentiate between unstructured and structured hackers. <clears throat> also, the, the differentiation that I like to make 
is the unfunded terrorist group slash hacktivists versus the funded terrorist groups or the international type of terrorist organizations uh, like an Al Qaeda um, that exist out there that have more resources, able to acquire more capabilities than just a single issue group. Next slide. You'll see some overlap here, and this is just a listing of the, the techniques or capabilities that we look at when we go through the risk assessment process. And I'd like to be able to, for each of these different types of attacks, be able to classify an adversary's capabilities against the system. Next slide. I'll put it in the context of cyber terrorism for a minute, because that's why I was the brought into the panel. Implications for cyber terrorism analysis. Right now, when we think of cyber terrorism, the debate is divided into two distinct communities. Uh, the one on the left that thinks that bin Laden lurks in every monitor and is able to shut down power on the East Coast tomorrow if he wanted to. And then the one on the right, which says the terrorists don't have any clue with regards to uh, attacking critical infrastructures or engaging in cyber terrorism. Um, the truth is somewhere in the middle. And we've been spending a lot of time trying to characterize or look at issues of cyber terrorism. And of course, if you fall into one of those categories, how much are you willing to bet that your answer is right? Uh, if, there's, uh, if they're lurking in every monitor, you're going to be spending a lot of money. Uh, if you think that they have no capability, you possibly leave yourself open to exposure. Slide. Characterizing cyber terrorists. Historical analysis doesn't work. Right? How many people in the room think we've actually had an act of cyber terrorism? Not a single person. I would agree with you 100%. There's been no true act of cyber terrorism that's ever happened. Uh, <clears throat> did, we did a private interview with Alvin Toffler, the futurist, for a conference we did uh, out in California about a year ago. And he had a quote that uh, I thought was very pertinent to this whole discussion. He said, September 11th involved a failure of imagination, failure to perceive the threat as it existed, failure <clears throat> to actually think that they would hijack things like perceptions. They didn't just hijack a plane. They hijacked our perceptions of what a hijacking was. Right, prior to September 11th, 700 plus hijackings take place for one of three reasons, to either flee a geographic region, to attract media attention to a particular cause, or to use the plane and its passengers as a bargaining chip for some sort of uh, political exchange. <clears throat> our perception of hijacking was based entirely on that. I don't want our perception of cyber terrorism to be based on the experience countering hackers uh, or looking at uh, cyber terrorism as defined by the media. We need to do a little bit more of the red teaming type of stuff that Dave spoke to uh, and start to imagine the threat and doing the characterization of what we're actually seeing in the real environment, trying to determine who's behind it so we can start to scope in the problem. <clears throat> Next slide. What are some of the key issues from a cyber terrorism perspective? And we drew these from what we knew about real terrorists. So when we started to try and characterize cyber terrorists, we said, okay, well, what do we know about terrorists in general that might apply to cyber terrorism? Uh, the one thing that we wanted to distinguish was the nature of terrorism had changed. That was an important point for us because it increased the scope of the, the cyber terror community from our perspective. Of those groups that engaged in the 700 plus hijackings prior to September 11th, how many of them are going to engage in hijackings for those purposes today? How many of them want to be um, compared or have their, their cause that where they've always used calculated political violence be associated with groups like Al Qaeda seeking weapons of mass destruction, weapons of mass casualty? Uh, in our opinion, there were groups out there above and beyond Al-Qaeda that were displaced by September 11th. And that increased the scope of cyber terrorism and that we expect to see uh, groups differentiate themselves by engaging in cyber terror attacks so that they don't have to engage in the actual hijacking. Lessons learned by terrorist organizations. I've got a guy who will give a complete day-long presentation on the lesson learned process as the terrorist organizations have experienced it over the past 30 years. They evaluate what's happened. They develop their own lessons learned from not only successful attacks, but from failed attacks. 
And in looking at cyber terrorism, the lessons that they're going to draw are going to be from what we see out there uh, in the wild. And also, in our opinion, what we see as far as critical infrastructure dependencies from things like strikes. What sort of lesson do you derive from the presidential intervention required to end the port strike on the West Coast? That's a key infrastructure, key node. Natural disasters that impact critical infrastructures helps them start to map out what some of the cascading effects are and draw lessons on their own. The long-term planning cycle. This is a key one from our perspective. Uh, we tend to think in terms of very compressed time windows. And from a terrorist perspective, we're facing adversaries that'll think in expanded uh, windows of time. They're willing to outweigh us. And that's an important thing. Five years in the planning and execution of the embassy attack in Africa. So even if, though we know that cyber terrorists, their cyber terror attacks are on the terrorist radar screen, we can't be expecting the fact that because some sheik in London talked about cyber terrorists six months ago that we're going to see it today. We have to understand that they're going to go through their own planning and capability acquisition cycle, and it might take them five years, but they'll take the time required to go through that. Well, another interesting point, too, that targets once identified will continually be attacked until destroyed. We see that perspective for a lot of different targets, whether it's the IRA or Al-Qaeda uh, or Islamic terrorists. You see that perspective, and that's important in doing characterization as well. <clears throat> because you can start to plan for, once you've identified an adversary as a terrorist, similar types of attacks against that same target or uh, targets within that same infrastructure. And then convergence. This is a key issue when we look at capabilities acquisition. A terrorist organization might not develop in-house the capabilities to engage in cyber attack, but they can converge with other organizations uh, with other groups or recruit in other environments to develop those capabilities. Uh, so I don't like dismissing the potential for cyber terrorism uh, within a group like Al-Qaeda because we don't think they have the capability when we know for a fact that they're conver they've converged with drug cartels, that they're cooperating with other terrorist organizations, and where there's money to be made or money to be uh, had, there's a lot of capabilities that other organizations can bring to the table. So we can't dismiss just based on the fact that we haven't seen a terrorist that's been trained to attack systems, although we have seen them uh, with MIS degrees, we've seen them bookmarking hacker websites, we know that there's an interest in the topic. Next slide. Likely aspects of cyber terrorism, when we bring everything to the table, we still believe the most likely form of cyber terrorism we're going to see is in parallel with a physical or WMD attack. If it can be used to augment or enhance the impact of a conventional attack, that that's going to be the most likely avenue. Impacting telecommunications after detonating a bomb, going after hospital systems after releasing uh, some sort of uh, chem bio device. There are lots of things that might be explored in order to augment the impact of the physical terrorism. Decrease confidence in critical infrastructures or engage in kind of psychological operations. We think that's an important one as well, although not as attractive. If you can go after economic infrastructures, if you can cause the public to panic, if you can be disruptive. Are there any folks here that live in the Washington, D.C. area? Got a handful. How disruptive were two guys with a Bushmash, Bushmaster rifle over a period of several weeks? They had an economic impact, had people changing their behavior, zigzagging from the mall to the car we can be influenced easy by things that are outside our control or things that we don't understand or are fearful of, and cyber terrorism can be used in that manner. To cause physical damage and or loss of human life, this, this is the sexy form of cyber terrorism that you read about in novels or see in movies, and it's the most attractive from a terrorist perspective. Uh, if you can be in Pakistan and cause planes to crash, you've uh, accomplished your objective, you've launched a spectacular attack, but you haven't had to expose yourself to getting caught. Uh, fortunately, while it's the most attractive, it's also the least probable. Because if you actually go and look at some of those infrastructures that could have a, a public safety impact from a mass casualty perspective, there are a lot of control measures in place, a lot of humans still in the loop that would prevent uh, anything really bad from happening. 
I always like to throw out the nation state as a sponsor or using as a tool of strategic influence. We're in a mindset right now, at least within the US government, that any sort of attack on critical infrastructure as we see, it would be the blame bin Laden game. And we need to remember that we live in a larger world, a larger context. Uh, what we think might be cyber terrorism might be uh, an 18 year old hacker, or it might be a nation state following uh, unrestricted warfare doctrine and engaging in little strategic wars of influence in cyberspace. So I like to always throw that out too, is that we don't so narrowly define our scope that we're not looking at the other threats. That's all that I have uh, at this point. I've been asked to, to kind of moderate the discussion, open it up to questions. So I'd throw it to the audience if they have any questions for the panelists. If not, I've got a list of things that I can ask. Go ahead. Oop. Right over here in the white. Let me, they asked that we repeat the question. So the question was uh, how the rating can be used uh, for intrusion detection or situation awareness. Um, well, the, ra the, the rating actually, the rating the hacker uh, model that it came up with came from me working as an intrusion detection analyst, came from me looking at packets eight hours a day, trying to get an idea of what we're, what I'm dealing with five to seven days a week and being able to present what I'm dealing with, um, uh, a measurement to management as to what we're, as, as to what they're seeing and I'm seeing on the network every day. You know, if, uh, for instance, if I see a Unix RPC exploit, not the one that was just released last week, you know, from three years ago, and I see it attacking uh, a Windows box, you know, if you go through, if you go through the uh, steps of my model, it's going to tell you pretty much that guy's probably a script kitty. It's not going to be something that you need to uh, lose sleep over. And you can sit there and tell your boss, okay, here's what I, here's what I saw, here's what I came up with. I really don't think he's something to worry about. Maybe we should just keep eye on him. Whereas, you know, if, if you see if if your IDS caught something that's like a zero-day exploit and it just caught it because of the uh, shell code, and you've never seen it before, you've checked the mailing list, you've checked whatever, and you've come to realize it's a zero-day exploit. That's something that uh, that is going to require a lot more of attention and a lot more um, resources to recover from if it was successful. And that's where. You know that's where that would it would come in into play as far as that goes. Did I answer? Your qu Hopefully, I answered your question. Pretty much. I mean, because you're taking you're taking very various characteristics from the attack. You know, the the um, source uh, operating system. Which can be tricked. I'm not going to. I'm not going to deny that. You're taking the type of attack. You're taking. Uh, if you combine my exploit uh, uh, field along with Tom's uh, tool field, you're taking the tools. You're taking. If there's intelligence gathering, you're going to take that into account. If not, you know, so on and so forth. One of the one of the things that I, I did I did leave out in the second one that I had in the first was I also had a uh, part where you uh, rated also the um, criticality of the server that was being attacked or the box that was being attacked. Um, you know, if somebody's, uh, somebody's attack, attacking a workstation, well, well, you know, it, it's critical, but it's not as critical as somebody attacking a credit card or server that stores your uh, company's uh, customer's credit cards and, you know, it's the key to your, to your company's survival. So, you know, that, that was part of my original uh, model as well. And I, I had taken it out briefly, and I had given this lecture over SANS, and um, I just haven't had a chance to update to Rev3, and I was going to throw that back in because I do think that is a critical part in um, coming up with an accurate uh, rating system. Other questions? There is one I saw over here. No. Go ahead.
Yeah, go ahead. Repeat um, the question. Though. Really, really. Okay. He, asked, he asked such a long question. <laughs> I, I wrote some of it down. Uh, you want to comment on capabilities uh, of IDS and logs and how we can tell what the adversary is doing, particularly as it applies to someone who's smart enough to uh, do the probing from one IP address and then launch the attack from another. How do you correlate the, the two to know that you're dealing with the same person? It's, it's going to be hard, and, and to be honest with you, you'll probably never be able to do it, but I think uh, either Dave said it or um, Matt said it. Um, this, this process is not, going to be, it's not a science at this point. Um, it, it's an art, and if you, in, uh, if you talk to uh, many of the FBI profilers, they'll tell you that their profiling is, even now, after 30 years of, of, of work, is still uh, an art, not an exact science. For anybody who lived in the D.C. area and heard all the so-called experts, the profilers who started the, um, the profiling business in the FBI, they had uh, our sniper uh, suspects last year as being white males, and they weren't. So, I mean, we may never be able to correlate and actually determine what's true, but the way, at least from my model, was set up and that, the way I tried to set it up was that that wouldn't be your sole scoring you wouldn't base your whole, you know, analysis or your whole uh, judgment on that one source. It would cover the source. It might it cover the operating system, the destination, and a whole bunch of other uh, characteristics. Uh, I think it was Dave who um, pointed out that you know we could give a a bit of code to you know all of you guys, and you would all use it in a different way. And I think you know. That's partially, you know, on that basis we can, you know, try and determine that um, an attack on the same host from two separate IP addresses could be the same person. Um, maybe they're trying to um, exploit a service um, using the same bit of code. Maybe they're, um, you know, maybe they're using trying to use the same return address. Um, maybe they brute forced it from one IP address. They got the ad address and, you know, and then tried to the, act the actual hack from, you know, another IP. Um, obviously, there's a question of time frame. Um, you know, if you've got a really busy host that's you know getting hit all the time by attacks, then it becomes very difficult. But if you've got you know a you know a quiet system that no one knows about, um, then you know th th doesn't get hit often. Then obviously, two hits within the same half hour from different IP addresses, you know, is, may signify that you know uh, the same person is uh, is trying to get you from two locations. There's a, there's a behavioral component to that, I think, too, which is eventually, you know, we had tried to a greater extent to involve the folks that do the profiling a little bit. Uh, because the same person, if you see multiple attacks, will engage in some of the same behavior. Probably everyone's worked on incidents that were of that nature. They start developing an MO, or almost a kind of context to the attack uh, that you can start working with over time to determine, yeah, this is the same person, or it's somebody very closely aligned because we're seeing a lot of the same structure, uh, seeing a lot of the same context to the attack. Had one over here, and then we'll go over here. Yes. Yeah, uh, you said a lot is focused on the network intrusion detection, which is good, but for some adversaries we face, social engineering might be a more effective mechanism of obtaining the access that they're looking for uh, and what's being done to address that. Um, as far as the social engineering goes, in my model I do cover social engineering um, as far as intelligence gathering goes. The only problem with social engineering is uh, how are you going to prove it? How are you going to prove your, your system or co was compromised by social engineering? It is, it is extremely difficult to sit here and, and prove that your system was hacked because of a social engineering attack. Just because, you know, the, the whole social, social engineering concept can cover many people. 
and it, it would be hard for you to, pin, to be able to pinpoint the 10 people, for example, that, w that were social engineered in order to hack your uh, credit card server. As far as um, the, the kind of social engineering and the kind of overall characterization goes, um, as Dave said to start with, um, this is a huge pie, and probably today, um, you know, from the panel, you're probably seeing, you know, less than 70% of that pie. Um, in the original workshops, we had um, behavioral scientists from FBI involved. We had um, people who study, um, you know, handwriting, who look at, you know, the language on defacements, you know, to see if we can determine, you know, the age group of the adversary. Um, if, if someone you know hacked a site, you know maybe they asked, you know they may, maybe they persuaded someone out of username and password, um, then I, th I think with with things like social engineering, you find that um, the the people that actually that do proper social engineering are one uh, deviation high, one age group deviation higher than your average script kitty, um, because they have to be socially developed enough to in in order to be able to understand you know what you know say you know what to say to you know to get what they want. Um, so, you know, it isn't just about IDS, you know, logs. Um, th there are a lot of other um, bits of the pie um, that maybe we haven't represented um, wholly today here that, you know, that go into the overall characterization. I think you're, you're on to a key point from the cyber terrorism perspective. About 18 months ago to that list of capabilities that I put up there, we added one called insider placement that was based on experience that we were having where it was difficult or beyond the capability of the person that was trying to uh, penetrate into the critical infrastructure from the outside, they didn't have the capability to engage in that attack because of the security posture, but because of failure to, you know, check out folks with access to, with system administrator privileges, uh, things of that sort, it was easier from a personnel perspective to actually get hired into the company as an administrator and start from the inside. And we've seen instances of that and that's something that we always try to bring. And when we look at terrorists, for some infrastructures, we'll st specifically point out, yeah, the likelihood of you seeing you know, a custom tool or a zero-day exploit against your infrastructure from a terrorist organization is very small. The likelihood of you seeing them trying to place someone inside the infrastructure and going from there is much larger. So that's definitely something that needs to be folded into the mix when dealing with that adversary. So, something else I want to comment on the, the IDS thing. They've been trying to do correlation for years, understand how to put the attack together. Uh, I, I don't think they're there yet. And one of the things we do is, when, when we start building an attack, start structuring it how it happened, trying to get all the pieces together, sometimes you'll see a big gap. And so we'll put a box in there. You can, you can label it a miracle or whatever you want. But typically it is the social engineering aspect, got the information to allow the next step to occur. And, and another thing as far as the non-cyber information, um, especially in, in uh, Matt's world, I think, is, um, you know, some intel might give you heightened awareness. And, you know, someone, someone threatens to do something, and it's a fairly credible threat. You know, every, everybody goes into a different condition, uh, and they're ready for it, and they expect that person or that group to be attacking. So they sort of narrow their focus. A question back here. Go ahead. The question was, uh, we speak a lot in the context of individuals, but what do you do about characterizing groups, especially groups that might have a high turnover rate within their membership? Yeah, the, 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 the social context of that, this is a difficult one, uh, where the capabilities and intent behind the intact probably start to give you the most leverage, at least from the groups that I'm interested in. Uh, but I think I'd be curious, it was one of the questions I had for the panel too, is um, you know, doing the adversary characterization, at what point do you tie in some of the analysis after incident or the honeypot type of analysis, the social context of the attack? Uh, what does someone do once they've been able to successfully attack the system? Do they enable it uh, as an IRC server and all of their friends log in? 
there are things like that that you can correlate with kind of past attack honeypot analysis, I think, to start doing some of the, the group characterization. Um, as, as I said earlier, um, the, when you look at the, the tools guys are using, if they're private tools that have been written by the group, then obviously you know you may be able to detect that a group of indi individuals are you know attacking the system because they obviously share the same resource. You know they share you know technology with each other. You know new vulnerabilities, um, what have you. They you know some you know one member in the group may have you know found a SQL injection bug in your site and you decided to share with you know the other members of his group. Um, the um, other members of, of his group are obviously you know likely to be friends of his, um, so they're going to be you know maybe similar kind of personalities, um, you know at least a you know maybe a similar age group at least. Also, I just want to add, um, yeah, we, we have the concept of groups also, and so what we do is go up a level of abstraction. We can't stay at the tactical level because the tools change, but the tactics should be similar in a group, even with high turnover, because there may be mentoring involved. Uh, so you should be able to see eventually, if you gather enough information, that this group was, you know, the genesis of this person, and there's the teachings of this person are, are, sh are shown in the tactics of these people. Uh, the other thing we look at, obviously, the com commonality. And one of the common things we look for, as I think Matt mentioned as well, is the target itself. And what are, what are they going after? Uh, the question is, what sort of work's been done to validate the models that you're looking at? As far as my as far as my models go, I, I've correlated it with the honeypot data that I have that I run, the honeypots that I run at home, and uh, I've presented the data to the SANS conference in the past. Um, if you'd like to see some of the data, um, I'd be if you send me an email, I'll be more than happy to send you the data that I have, along with um, the model as well. And actually, for anybody who's interested, I mean, I have the model up right here, the original model, which has everything that I thought was involved that should be involved, some of you guys have brought up as well. So, uh, you know, if anybody wants to see the data that I used, send me an email, and I'd be happy to send it to you. I haven't done that per se, but when we had the workshop last yeah, year, th th that was that was one of the purposes of the workshop um, that we've had to kind of to present our ideas um, and to have people, you know, play devil's advocate um, so we can improve our ideas. Um, obviously, you know, all the models we put together have come from you know s studying and personal experience of you know of, of communities, you know, groups of people, um, you know. Toby's experience with, you know, I, analyzing IDS logs. Um, so th there is, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, real life background behind um, all, of, all of the models. You're right, yeah. they don't have the baseline for that one-on-one -on -one type of debrief slash interview process. Uh, and that'll probably impact over time how you're able to refine the, the models. Oh, also the FBI, I had lunch with the FBI last year during the conference, or during the workshop. And they, they're going through a process that's similar to this, except they're going out and asking people who are um, who have been convicted of computer crimes and trying to get, get a profile based on off the answers that they get from the questionnaires that they've come up with. Yeah, I, I was going to say the FBI had, did have plans at the workshop to do that. They had just started. I haven't seen any results yet. But the, the one thing you have to wonder about that in cyber crimes, um, Especially since it's pretty new, you got a lot of early ones. You know, did you catch the dumb guys? You know, the typical problem with that. And then, uh, depending on who you're dealing with, when you do interviews in prison, 
Um, you don't always get the truth out of these guys. You know, I know that's a surprise, but it happens. So uh, there also is information that DOD does a lot of that for their insider uh, incidents. So they capture the data, and, and we've talked to them as well. They were at the workshop. Other questions? Yes. question is does the uh, the rating system is it impacted by what the perceived response to the activity would be or the attack would be but the, I, yeah mm -hmm. yes that's that's the whole point you don't want to send all your resources just because someone sent a packet to your network and I see a lot of that happening. Uh, you know, they see a port scan there, you know, oh, I'm getting DOSed, or what do I do? You know, they, they, they overreact. So the idea is to, for them to understand, you know, what's coming at them, what protection they need, and how they need to respond. Yeah, if that happens every time, then you, you obviously need to adjust. But you know, the other problem with that is the high-end adversary may want to redirect attribution to the low end. So, you know, and we've brought up also someone running a, a three-year-old exploit. If it's effective, the high-end may use it too. So, yeah, it's not absolute. Another thing to remember is that uh, the rating model that, that, that we presented here is only a small piece of the pie. If you incorporate that with what everybody else has brought to the table, and you threw, and you put that all in one pie, you know, you you get a bit a better picture of what a, what actually is going on versus just that little, my little piece of the pie. being told we're out of time. So I guess there's was one last follow-up. If folks are interested, uh, you have the email address that I guess you closed down already. Contact folks via email. Yeah, and for the press members, uh, we'll be in the press room for the next 15 minutes uh, as required by the speakers. For everybody else, we'll be at the social drinking beer and eating chicken wings. So <laughs> we'll see you there. Thank you. Yeah.